Hello and welcome to another episode of the FSEA Digital Embellishment Podcast. Today I am very lucky to have two wonderful guests from a fantastic company called Elite Print Finishing in North Carolina. We have Stephen Roberts, who is the owner. Stephen, how are you? I'm doing great, Kev. I feel lucky to be in your presence. I'm not sure how lucky you are. <laughs> I'm very lucky, Stephen. And 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 we also have the of sales for Elite Print Finishing, Bryce Paramba. Bryce, how Good, are you? Good, man. Thanks for having me. Ah, uh, no problem. Guys, tell me a little bit about Elite Print Finishing. I know that I'm a big fan of what you do, and I've seen all the, the awards that you've won and all the different, what is it, the Gold Leaf Awards and, and, and so on and so forth. Why don't you guys tell me just a little bit about your company and what makes you guys awesome? That's what I want to know. Bryce, you take that one. He said award, and I got excited because we've got such we, we've got a few headed our way here soon, and I can't wait to get there. So I'm, in, I'm giddy. Bryce, you go ahead. Well, Ali is a finishing company in Burlington, North Carolina that has been around for a little over 30 years now. And we are trying to stay with the times as much as possible. I think that's one of the cool things about us is our constant want to um, be cool and and be exciting and be fresh and bring youth and youthful thoughts and just staying current. And that's one of the things that I really enjoy about our company. And our diversification of equipment kind of helps us with that, the way that we think and kind of the whole way that the leadership teams approaches things. So that's one of the the cool things that we have going on at Ali, other than that, we're a trade finisher. We specialize in foil stamping, UV coating, die cutting, folding and gluing. We we do a lot for both the commercial printing industry and the packaging industry. So some of the vertical markets that we serve are tobacco, trading cards, pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, textiles, multimedia. Am I missing anything, Steve? That's kind of a... The, no, the, you, the, you, you rounded that off sure. very well. I, I would say I, I'm... The cool part, I don't have an issue with the staying young and youthful. I'm, I'm tending to have an issue. With. <laughs> hey, it's on your mind, man. It's on your mind, Stephen. Anybody who knows you knows that's not a problem with you, too. So, <laughs> so listen, tell me, guys. So, Stephen, let's start with you. You were, you were, I think, three years ago, right before COVID, you decided, hey, now is a good time to bring in digital embellishment. Tell me something. How have you seen adding digital foil and coatings to your operation? How does that open, like, has it opened new business, new opportunities for you guys, or was it just really reinforcing what you already had and taking that to the next step? Tell us a little bit about what that brought to your business. So, so great, great, great question. So just so everyone knows who's going to view this, when we made our purchase for our, our, our machine and decided to get into this type of work, we did not have prior notice to COVID coming. Okay, our machine was on the floor and we were training. So we're not, there was a moment, there was absolutely a moment of, oh my, what just happened, you know? But it, it all has worked out. So that should be the first thing to note is, yes, it, it has been a, a positive, it has absolutely made a positive impact on Elite Print Finishing and, and for our team here. I would say that you know, there definitely was a few challenges out of the gate with, with anything, but it has absolutely opened up new markets for us. It's opened up new discussions with existing accounts prior to the new technology going in. And one of the big positive things that, that I think has been a big capital, capital thing for us here has been it actually downstreamed. It fed more it fed more of our processes. It gave us more die cutting. It gave us more film laminating. It gave us the opportunity to glue a lot more products, whether it was on the commercial side of what we do or, or the, the packaging side. So yes, it's, it's been a positive thing for us. Oh, that's fantastic. Bryce, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that the, the, him hitting on the, it, how it's advanced our business in other ways. The MGI has been awesome for us as a salesperson. You know, he brought up, we bought mm. this press right before COVID. So as a salesperson, we weren't able to, you know, get a lot of meetings during COVID. So having a new piece of technology with really cool samples where we were able to go in and show somebody something they had never seen before, all of a sudden gave us a reason to start a conversation, a reason for us to get on a Zoom call and send out some samples, a reason for us to maybe 
get in the door. And not only then were we able to talk about our MGI press, but then, hey, actually, we are a little open on our die cutter. We do have some work, you know, some room on the folder gluer or something like that. So it was a great way in the door that also advanced our business in other ways, too. So overall, it was a blessing in disguise. Yeah, no kidding, man. You got you got to talk about some fresh ammo to go sure. out. Get in, it certainly uh... re-energized, it re-energized what we were doing, and I think it had a very positive effect on our on our core customer customer base. I think it it energized them and gave them the opportunity to go out and have discussions that maybe they really wouldn't have had potential of having during that that tough time. That's a great point, Stephen. I think what you're saying is that it energized your sales team in part because they saw the reactions that the clients that you were going to go visit, you know, saw when they saw that thing. And it, it's kind of a domino effect, right? The, the holy crap look. And, you know, you look at it, you feel it, you're like, oh, this, they're going to love this. When your customer side goes, oh, my customers are going to love that. And then when their customers saw it, they go, oh, you know, these kids are going to love this in the stores or what's, you know, it, it just goes all the way down the, 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 the chain, but tell me, maybe Bryce, we'll start with you this time. You talked a lot about the different, you know, verticals that are really, that have been successful for you guys. Tell me what specific market or like industries seem to be like a good fit for this kind of finishing for digital based embellishments. Is there anything that, that kind of stands out to you? That's a good question. I, I think we see some overlap in what we currently do. It's allowed us to go into our current customers and have a new application, something that kind of jumps off the shelf even more than what we've done in the past. It doesn't work for every, you know, every size job, but it we, we do see some overlap there. I would say the, the biggest space that we see growth in right now is probably the pharmaceutical and nutraceutical industries. Just there's, there's so many, there's so much competition on the shelf in those two industries that it kind of, kind of seems like everybody is competing with each other to make the most vibrant and exciting carton because that is their, you know, first contact with the customer. That's how they're displaying their their product. And if they have a product on the shelf right next to it, that's very similar. I'm not going to say it's exactly the same, but you know, very very similar. It can sometimes the difference can be that digital embellishment, that person being able to pick it up and touch and feel some 3D coating on the front of it that really makes it stand out above the competition. So those two markets, I would say, have been the biggest for us starting out. Yeah. That's cool. It's kind of like if you ever go to a sports store and you go to the golf ball aisle, just, just, it's just so beautiful. The amount of embellishment that golf balls are, <laughs> and each of them have to be sexier than the last or else they're not going to sure. pull. Steven, how about you? We were talking about golf a little bit earlier, but what have you kind of seen in terms of some of the best markets or verticals for this kind of stuff? Yeah. So a couple of different ways to look at it, Kev, you know, you've, you've got the retail shelf and a lot of these folks Maybe, well, in golf balls, all golf bars aren't, aren't made the same to do the same thing. In Bryce's case, his golf ball seems to perform better than mine. So <laughs> it's I, the packaging. I'm not really sure. <laughs> so it's got to be the box. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, you have to understand if this product that's going through this technology is going to a retail shelf. Okay, I got a great story to tell you, but it. it a lot of these folks are putting likewise product into a, a carton. So it, it, it's, it's our carton and their art that in a lot of cases are going to build a perception that's going to be the winner of what that or in that retail setting pulls off the shelf and places in the cart. Hmm. So that, that's, that is a big deal. We, we had a carton that we, we go out to a show and in their catalog, it flat out says it's their page. They're congratulating them on their carton and the how shelf how important shelf appeal is. So it's like, well, it, this is the perfect commercial. I, I wish I could have taken it out during the Super Bowl, you know. Wow. Um, yeah. So I think that's really important is to get off the you know for cartons to be or product to be pulled off the shelf the, the shelf appeal. The other thing you got to remember is we run a lot of items through this machine that could be for college recruiting. You know, all these universities, all these colleges, they're all competing, not just in football and basketball. They're competing to get to get students enrolled so they can cap capitalize on the dollars coming in. So you have that you have the ability and you hit a keyword a little while ago that nobody really teed off on was the, you know, the touch, the feel. You said you used the word feel, and that's been one of the biggest differences is not only is, are we affecting the visual sense, we're getting that touch sense, right? 
which were for a lot of brands and consumers, when they look at those brands, they're going to recognize that their perception is this feels better. It's got to be better. Mm. Same thing when they get their college information in the mail, when they're recruiting your son or your daughter, you go to school there. Wait a minute. I only want to take a look at this school based on, you know, what's coming in my mailbox. Mm. So, you know, they got seven seconds before they decide to put it in recycling. And if they keep it that extra seven seconds, that university or that person that's trying to offer them something that seven cents there, they just grew about 80% and their, their chances of, you know, getting that call, getting that email, getting that visit. Totally. Steven, I got to tell you some of the most bonkers pieces I've ever seen in digital embellishment were with college recruitment pieces where you would open up, there'd be gold and silver foil and you'd open it up and there'd be like a Jersey of the team that was recruiting you. And the name was embossed and variable, your name, variable data. variable data embossed on the Jersey back. And you'd look at it and you could touch your name. And I was just like, see, these people understand the effect of touch and how that they can all of a sudden now see, Oh, I could see myself wearing this Jersey. I could see myself playing for the school, I could see myself becoming a, a Gator or whatever. Or what are you, a Tar Heel? I wouldn't go that far, <laughs> but I, I certainly would consider signing with that school. Yeah, that's so good. That's so good. But I, I love what you're saying. And, and, you know, when we do talk about variable data, it's too bad. And I don't know if you guys have seen this at all, but I think it's one of the coolest things that are possible with digital embellishment, but it's also the number one most underutilized function or feature when it comes to digital embellishment. People are just not taking advantage of it yet. Are you kind of seeing the same thing? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that comes into where we're, we're trying to make a difference here. You know, we've got a lot of different avenues, different things going on. One thing we're doing here specifically at a lead is we, we've branded what we're doing down there is E3D so that folks automatically can see, wait, this is different. What's, what's the difference? We need to look into it. You know, I think the other th thing that's important here is getting designers on board. So what we're doing now is we're trying to get different designers to come in and go through the certification process. And it's only going to help them and it's going to help us because so many people still don't understand yet that, hey, I've got this piece of artwork, make it better. But now if they know up front when they design that, it's going to it's gonna be the real grand slam effect, whether it's on a shelf or in a mailbox. Is that so, working for you guys? Because I know that probably the number one obstacle most people in the digital embellishment space do have to, to deal with is art and the design and making sure that it's designed correctly. And most of the times the files that come in are totally backwards or not done correctly. And you actually end up having to spend more time redoing their files. So I know some printers are like, you know what, just don't even give it a shot. Let me do it. I'll do the whole thing. It'll cost an extra whatever, but let me design for it. Or do you find that going out there and actually preaching the word and banging the drum on the soapbox, <laughs> is that making a difference? Bryce, let's, yeah, Bryce, why don't you take that? Well, one? I think it's a good thing you got the, the sales guy on here as opposed to our internal designers because they... <laughs> they might answer it a little bit differently because it is a huge headache. You know, it is a completely new technology, you know, and so there yeah. is a bit of a learning, which is, you know, one of the small challenges that I find in the field is, is being able to, even as a salesperson, I'm, I'm familiar with the technology. I felt it. I've, I've, you know, sold many, many jobs for it. I've been there to get through some hurdles as the press was new and we were learning how the different, you know, coatings go on different substrates so the different foils you know react better with certain things so i feel you know like uh, i have a good understanding of the technology but that's still so hard to sometimes translate or mm -hmm. i guess get across to the customer and their designers because it's new so i think that we've approached it in both of those ways i think the first way we handle it is when we've had a lot of issues and we continue to have the same issues we go okay guys how about we kind of, you know, and we've brought a designer on board who is E3D certified sure. and helps from that standpoint. So sometimes it's easier just to hand it over to them. They know what they're doing and we have the customer maybe connect over a, you know, a PPP meeting or something like that, which we do for a beginner in order to kind of get the project off the ground, get the customer on board with what we're going to do. Or we, one of the cool things that our, our E3D guys did was they came out with a generic PDF that converts to an AI file. And it kind of goes through and explains to our customer that they build like a generic template in essence of something that has E3D varnish on it, as well as E3D foil. 
And it's an example template of either, you know, a commercial booklet or a, a package, depending on what kind of customer we're sending it to and gives them an example to follow. Nice. So we've, we've used both of those approaches, but it can still wow. sometimes be difficult even with, 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 with no those. Kidding. So, yeah. Now you, you guys did say something I think is interesting. You guys said, not only did you brand your own offering E3D, but you also have E3D certification. Did I hear that correctly? <laughs> yeah. Yes. That that's correct. That's correct. So what we're doing there is it's a win-win situation. One, we're, we're bringing designers in, having them become qualified. When I was in the Navy, it was called, you got to get your, your qual signed off. So they have to come in and get their qual signed off, right? And at the end of it, they get a certificate so they can market to their customer base and be able to say, hey, let me show you what's going on out here now with what, we, what, what I can design for you. And then also, you're subliminally hopefully getting better artwork out of the gate and it, it it we can agree we would we would say yes we we are part of that group that has had a struggle in getting files in that work for what we're trying to do so and that, sure. that, you know one it's time two it's money right so it, it can back it can back your production up especially when you're trying to plan for a post process after that after it comes out of the E3D room. Oh, that's great. I think it's smart though. It's the, the right way to do it. I think come up in your own certification standards. That's uh, that's the first I've heard of that. So well done on that guys. Tell me something. We talked a little bit about the, the limitations around the design capabilities or just the knowledge. Cause let's be honest, a lot of the designers who are coming out of school today aren't really trained for print or print embellishments, but let's talk some of the other limitations that you guys run into when it comes to digital foil and coding that you share with your customers. Is there anything that stands off the bat? Do you talk to your clients about it? Like uh, obviously there's the, the whole uncoded or how thin you go in terms of, of font types. I don't know. Bryce, why don't you take sure. this one? I, I think that from a broad perspective, the difficulty has been who we're selling this technology to. This is in the past as a trade finisher, our sales team goes in, we meet with maybe somebody who controls outsourcing, right? And say, hey guy, just want to let you know, we do die cutting. Well, die cutting has been around for a long time. They're, you know, outsourcing buyer is probably familiar with that technology. They know our presses. So it's very simple, right? We just are, are making introductions and, and that's the type of person that we're going after. I think the different part, the, the different sales approach that we have to take with this, and I, I guess you could call it a difficulty would be that we're now having to go after either the sales team or the design team at our printing companies or packaging companies. And we've had to teach ourselves kind of how to connect with those people. We, we definitely want to give, if we don't get samples and we don't get information to the sales team who's selling the end user, then it's very difficult for somebody to understand a 3D embellishment or a 3D foil. What is that, right? So we have to kind of change the way in which we sell to our customers. That's been a challenge we've, you know, I've faced as far as sales is concerned. That's really yeah. interesting. How about you, Stephen? Anything on the technical side? Yeah, he did well with that. I mean, you know, the, I don't know if technical, but more material, you know, it's growing. It's a slow process at the moment, but it is growing. But foil, uh, different kinds of foil that you can, you can utilize. Conventionally, we can pretty much foil stamp any color out there under the sun. And here you, you do have some limitations. I, I, I want to say we're up to maybe 13 different types of or colors of foil. So that still has a ways to grow. Mm -hmm. The, un, the uncoated stock, you know, I think we've done a pretty good job of, you know, if a customer calls in and it has to be uncoated, we will try to steer to a lamination or we'll try to steer to a GPA stock that's out there that we, we tested. We'll plug I was going to say, soft touch. Shout, shout yeah, out, yeah, we all know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows that for Dragoni. That's saved so many people. Yeah. So, I have some videos out, by the way, if you guys want, I'll send them to you. But we got we made some really good videos on how to coat uncoated stocks. So anyways, there's some there's some pretty cool tricks that like Matt has been able to, to crack and other people, too. It's working out there. So we'll, we'll send you that stuff. Maybe you can help. Yeah, absolutely. We, 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 we would always want to want to see if somebody's got a way to do something that maybe mm. we're struggling with or maybe. Yeah. We just haven't tried yet. We certainly want to see that. One yeah. thing I'll, I'll add to, that we, we kind of touched on, 
And Bryce had said that if the quantity, sometimes we've found quantities that don't work well inside that room. I, I agree. You certainly can, can run into those roadblocks where the quantity makes, it just makes better sense to do it conventionally. But, and I think this is what we got to get across to our designers, right? Mm-hmm. If the project is designed, if what the customer is asking for can't be done conventionally, so that's a big plus side, right? I don't care if it's one sheet or a million sheets. If it can't be done conventionally, it has to run through the digital you know, E3D room over here. There, there's not a choice. So now, is there is there a cost that could be in consideration whether that job's going to take off or whether it's never going to grow legs? Yeah, that certainly is, is part of it. But we've ran really large jobs through there, through that room. Yeah, we've ran 50 sheets, but we've also ran a half a million sheets. Mm. So you, you have to keep that. This is a good time to plug sure. Steve. Sure. He just sold about a 350,000 sheet run in there uh, <laughs> at the end of last year. So he's, yeah, it is. It, 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 and that, you know, it's great, you know, because when we first bought this technology, awesome. we thought that it was going to be our solution to you know, 50 sheets or 100 sheets for somebody that didn't want to purchase a die and, and that mm. that would be the only benefit. And then we started to see that there was this whole other side of people who wanted to really capitalize off of the 3D and the, the feeling and the, the different look that it gave you. And you can't gain that. I mean, we've been foil stamping yeah. and UV coating for a long, long time, and we could never get to the types of detail and precision that we're getting on the MGI press. So interesting. Yeah. So it's if, like, if I were it's to crazy. give you one choice, Bryce, sure. I'm going to take away one or two things. I'm going to take away the 3D capabilities off of your machine, okay. or take away the foil capabilities off Ooh. your machine. Which one do you? Keep That's a and really, why? really, really tough question. I'd have to. The best way would be to get my sales out and see which one was higher, but I can't do that right <laughs> now. I don't know. I, I think I would probably lean towards the three the 3D. I think one of the big benefits, I'll start with the foil side of it since I didn't choose that, but the benefits on the foil side are, you know, we're not making impressions on sheets anymore. So, you know, for things like direct mail or books, things like that, where you have two-sided, yeah, yeah exactly, covers. where you have two-sided yeah. material, it's really beneficial. Yeah. But on the foil side, we also have the negative of the 13 colors that we have to choose from. So I, I would stick with the traditional yeah. foil stamping and then definitely go with the 3D coatings. What it's been able to do, wow. the level of depth that we can get compared to screen UV coating. Yeah. You know, if we want to do a, a a real thick foil stamp, we can do that. But as far as UV coating goes, we could never reach. I mean, we're three to four times the level of depth. You know, we're coming up yeah. a half inch off the sheet of paper. We're creating a baseball on top of a sheet of paper. We're creating a cell phone That's on cool. top of the That's iPhone cool. box. You know, I mean, it's just it's crazy what we're able to do. So That's yeah, so cool. Ooh. Yeah. How about you, Stephen? If you, had, if you had to pick between varnish and 3D. Okay, so... I mean, foil and 3D. I, I'm sorry. I, I love foil. been foiling for a long time, and I love the foil effect. I love the textured foil effect. But if you're going to make me choose, Bryce has a customer, a great guy, truly blessed individual, and he calls me Steve. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> that doesn't tell you which way I'm going. I got I'm you. going varnish, and it has nothing to do with it running quicker through the machine. I just absolutely love what the 3D varnish does to ink. And now, when I walk through the plant and I look at jobs that are maybe it's just a straight die cut and glue. I just look at the sheet and I go, it just doesn't look finished anymore. Yeah. It doesn't look right without the, the varnish on top of it. That's so I mean, funny. we're not talking about just giving someone an embossed look. We're talking about really transforming their inks, okay? Because it just looks so much better. So Stevie Varnish is going along Stevie with Varnish. Friday. Maybe my golf ball will start performing, but I'm seeing things like this. That's so, oh, you know, it's so funny. The first Lux pack I ever did, we just went up there and we put up samples and we had just done, this is like the first time that we come out with 3D back when I was with MGI. And one of the samples, I don't know if you've ever seen it, was a Spartacus. Remember the show Spartacus came out? It was like all the rage in like 2010, whatever. And it's basically like the DVD cover and on it, there's like a lot of blood that we had put in 3D and I had some of the samples on the floor and I remember just the janitor walking by and going, oh my God, are you okay? I'm like, what are you talking about? And he was like pointing at the sheets that were varnished in 3D on top of the blood 
and they had literally, when I looked at it from his angle, it looked like somebody had sliced their, themselves open and just bled on it because it was that dimensional. And I go, no, no, look, it's dry. It's fine. He's like, whoa. So when you could blow the mind off of a janitor walking by, you know, who's really, you know, doesn't know much about print, but he understands how impactful that was. I was like, okay, we got something here. So I think we just went three for three on the varnish. Our friends that are on the <laughs> FSDA board from Kurz and different yeah. coal companies are Sorry. not going to yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. Well, listen, I wanted to take the time to thank you guys for uh, for really sharing your insights. And, uh, and obviously, it's something that we can all learn a lot from. Stephen, Bryce. Thank you. If we want to get in contact with you, or let's say we need to send you some work because we don't have this capability in house, what's the best way to come see you guys? Well, we, we love having company, you know, so you yeah. can always come see us. You can always email us. It, it, we will be glad to come see, see you folks too. So anything we can do to help out, we want to do. Okay. You know, so let us know what your needs or someone else's needs are. Okay, and if I were to ask for an email, uh, a web address or a website, it's www.epfinc.com, and you can find all our email addresses there, there. Steve's contacts there. If you have any questions you want to blow up him, that would be great. He needs a little bit more work to do so he can stay off the golf course. So, yeah. <laughs> He's coming after you, Steve. He's coming after you. All right. You guys have been phenomenal. Thank you so much for your time. And, uh, and yeah, listen, we, we really want to thank you because a lot of this is around the DEA that we formed at the FSEA and the DEA is going to be the digital embellishment Alliance. We're growing this thing. We think there's going to be a lot that we can all learn from each other. We're all developing these cool little tricks in the corner. And we think that, you know, once we group together under one umbrella under, under the FSEA umbrella, there's going to be a lot more for us to share. So thank you for, for all your help and doing so good for the industry. It's a really, really refreshing to hear. Kevin, thank you. Thank you for your time and just glad to help out. I, I feel smarter for just sitting down and having another conversation with <laughs> yeah. you. So let's keep Absolutely. Going. Thanks for all you're doing, man. It really makes an impact. And hopefully this helps those out there. And if you have any insight as, you know, if there are other press centers out there that have insight and want to reach out to us for things that they're, they're seeing and doing that are working for them, we'd love to share information back and forth. I think it's important that we all move this in, information and technology forward together. So thank you so much, Kev. Amen, yeah. Bryce. Amen. Thank you very much, guys. Yeah. See you soon. Take care. See you guys. Take care.